Good evening. Welcome to the PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, uh, March the 7th. We'll be singing a few songs from hymns of faith and praise. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper together, and I will deliver a lesson that hopefully will be beneficial to each one of us. So if you have your songbooks handy, turn them please to number 578. 578. We will glorify. Let's sing the first, second, and fourth. One, two, four. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness. We will worship him alone. Hallelujah to the King of Kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Number 488. Into the heart of Jesus. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. 1 and 4. <clears throat> Into the heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, seeking to know the reason why he should love me so, why he should stoop to lift me up from the miry clay, saving my soul, making me whole, though I had wandered away. Into the joy of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go, rising with souls enraptured far from the world below. Joy in the place of sorrow, Peace in the midst of pain, Jesus will give, Jesus will give, He will uphold and sustain. 246. This will be the song before we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Two forty six. Let me be a sacrifice. When we think of this, we think of of being a sacrifice on our own level. But uh, as a song in prelude to the Lord's Supper, it is uh, thinking about the sacrifice that Jesus made for each one of us. Let me be a sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice consumed in your praise. Let me be a sacrifice holy and acceptable. Let me be a sacrifice worshiping your name. You know, uh, when Jesus... Um, celebrated the Passover for the last time with his disciples, he gathered about the table and he showed the very uh, intimate uh, symbolism that was involved in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. He intimated and as so much said 
that uh, uh, he would give up his body and he would give up his blood so that we might live, that he would make the sacrifice. Jesus sent him, uh, God sent him to the earth expressly knowing that this would happen. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, it says that uh, Christians gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. And through the New Testament, all the way through the letter to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, Paul celebrates the Lord's Supper with them and uses literally the same words uh, that Jesus used when he gave thanks for the body and he gave thanks for the blood, the symbolism of the bread and the fruit of the vine. With that in mind, uh, let's pray for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we're just so thankful that uh, this was all a part of your great master plan. And we're so grateful that Jesus was willing to die on the cross, that he was willing to suffer the agony in his body, uh, that he was willing to go through that horrible death of crucifixion, and that he did it for each one of us. So as we partake of this bread, let us think of the body that Jesus gave up for us. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says in the same manner, after they took the bread, they took the cup. And uh, let's give thought to the innocent blood that was shed. Let's pray again. Our Heavenly Father, uh, we know the significance of blood to a life. We know that blood is the very life of uh, human beings. And we know that as this flows through our veins, what it, it does is it carries everything to every part of our body. And we're just so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that Jesus was willing to shed his blood. And that would be the blood that washes away our sins. Let us be grateful for that wonderful sacrifice that Jesus made for us as we drink of this cup. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The Apostle Paul told us that on the first day of the week we should also lay by in store. And uh, even though uh, the giving part is is not in uh, 1 Corinthians 11. It, it's not in uh, the Passover feast uh, that we uh, commonly know as the Lord's Supper. But we, we kind of insert the giving here when we think in terms of what Jesus gave for each one of us. And so as we give, we uh, just understand that it's a paltry amount when we consider what Jesus gave for us. Let's pray for the giving. We're so thankful, dear Heavenly Father, that you have blessed us with material uh, means. We know that it takes material means to keep a, a church functioning. And we pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would give liberally and that we would give willingly that we would give in the knowledge that uh, this money would be used for the furtherance of your kingdom here on earth. Uh, bless us in this time of giving. We prayed in Jesus' most holy name, amen. And the song before the lesson is number 158. We'll sing all three verses. 
158, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you're the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you always hear me when I call. Oh, Jesus, you pick me up each time I fall. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, how I love to praise your name. Jesus, you're still the first, the last, the same. Oh, Jesus, you died and took away my shame. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you're the soon and coming King. Jesus, we need the love that you can bring. Oh, Jesus, we lift our voices up and sing. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. You're the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Hope you enjoyed the singing together. And I know that the Lord was praised in, in uh, this time of song. If uh, you were at services this morning, or if you caught the live stream, uh, you probably heard that the uh, lesson uh, this evening was called, entitled, As a New Christian. And some of you might say, uh-oh, Mark, I've been a Christian a long time. Uh, you sure this is going to apply to me? And I guarantee it. I, I guarantee that the words that we say are appropriate to whether you've been a Christian for a week, a month, a year, or 50 years. You know, when we're baptized into the family of God, it's an exciting time. Uh, Jesus says that in, in uh, John chapter 3, verses 3 to 5. It's a, it's a great experience to be baptized and to, to start our Christian life together. But uh, in reality, it is just the beginning. It's the beginning of our walk. It's the first step that puts one, according to Galatians 3, uh, 27, into Christ. And, you know, uh, one might surmise, look, uh, people have led me to be baptized. They've taught me uh, I need to be baptized. Okay, I'm baptized. I'm saved. Well, I'm saved. That's all I have to do. Uh-uh. Not so. Part of a Christian life is a constant endeavor to grow each day. And so as new Christians, we need to mature. We need to, to grow spiritually. And so I've outlined four different ways that uh, as new Christians, or just even as Christians, and I'm going to kind of put the title behind me, that we can grow spiritually. The first comes from the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, you know, in our station in life here in the United States, uh, you and I have probably been hungry a few times. We've probably been thirsty a few times. We've not been hungry like some of those uh, people in Africa uh, that have put up with famines and subsist on very, very small amounts of food a day. But we do know the term, and we do know what the term to be hungry or to be thirsty actually means. And because we know what it means, we know that folks will literally do anything to get food or to get drink. If we go to the Genesis account of uh, 
Isaac's two sons, Jacob and Esau. We remember Esau had gone out all day and hunted and worked very, very hard, and he was famished when he came in. And uh, uh, Jacob, with the help of his mom, had prepared a stew, and he smelled that stew, and Esau was so hungry that to partake of that stew, he gave up his birthright of the blessing from his father Isaac. Look at the extent to some people will go because they were hungry. So this is the first part of this statement from the Sermon on the Mount. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Righteousness is all about using that right in the beginning. It's all about having a right relationship with God. And so it should be one of our greatest desires to have a relationship with God that continues to grow. Peter was concerned about this when he wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that ought to be our goal. Our goal ought to be toward righteousness. It ought to be toward being more godly people. So number one, if we are going to grow spiritually, if we are going to get our Christian walk off on the right step, we need to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Number two, we need the fellowship of fellow Christians. Do we remember the, the day of Pentecost sermon when Peter preached and 3,000 were baptized and they literally went to all parts of the world uh, close to Jerusalem and they took the message with them and they were meeting in people's homes daily. Why? Because they knew that they could strengthen themselves in one another. It's kind of like having a rope with many strands. The book of Proverbs, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes talks about that, a rope with more strands in it. And the rope with more strands is stronger. And so our church is made up of many members. And as members of the Lord's church, we are there uh, not just because we want to be saved, and we do, but part of it is, is because we are lifted by being together, and we in turn are to lift one another. And so the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25, because he saw people starting to drift away. They were maybe taking the meeting on the Lord's day for granted. I don't know exactly what it was because the, the Hebrew writer doesn't say exactly what it was. But here's what he does say. In verse 24, he says, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, this is something that we ought to be doing all the time. But see, what the Hebrew writer does is he links stimulating one, or one another in, Lord and, in love and good deeds with being together as a church. And so in verse 25, after he says, let's consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, he says, not forsaking our assembling together, which is the habit of some. You know what? I will have a hard time stimulating you to love. I will have a hard time stimulating you to good deeds and you in turn that toward me if we don't meet together. 
It's part of how we indeed stimulate one another. And because they were forsaking the assembly, other problems started to creep in. And if we look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 13, let's look at these. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. If we are to grow, if we are to grow, if we are to grow in maturity, we need to be together. We need to be those many stranded, that many stranded rope in which strength comes from those strands. If we're not together and studying together, how can we hope to aspire to become teachers of the Lord's word. We'll stay in that milk stage all of our lives. You know, on Wednesday night, we have a Zoom class. We're studying Ezekiel in the Old Testament. And somebody asks, why in the world are you studying Ezekiel? Well, what we're finding out as we study Ezekiel is that many of the same problems that the people were having in captivity Many of the reasons why they wound up in captivity are the reasons that we stray away from the Lord. We're not going to be put in captivity. We're not going to wind up in Assyria. We're not going to wind up in Babylon. We're not going to wind up in Persia. If we're not careful, we're going to wind up in hell. We're not going to aspire to live eternally with the Lord because we have not been doing his will. We need Christian fellowship to help us to grow. And somewhere down the line, we can get off the baby food and we can get off the baby food of spiritual matters and get into the meat of God's word. And so we ought to gather together in order to glorify God for all he did for us. A few moments ago, we partook of the Lord's Supper to remember Jesus' death that he did for us, that we might have eternal life, that we might have forgiveness of sins. We sang songs of praise. We are to praise we had a, a short prayer over giving because we're supposed to give back to the Lord. And so as we do all a thing, all these things, we can think, just as that song said, of the sacrifice that was made for each one of you. Third, we have the Word of God, Holy Spirit inspired, written. It is in printed form. I know in today's modern world, everybody literally has an, an app on their cellular device that they can bring up the Bible. Now, I've watched many people uh, when uh, someone says open to, you know, John chapter uh, 6, verse 48, boom, 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 and there they have it. And by the way, that's okay. But we're supposed to study diligently. How do I know that? Jesus said it. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And if we go back to that hunger and thirst thing, number one on our list, just as the body cannot live with physical food, so the spiritual man cannot live without spiritual food. And that spiritual food is, is the word of God. In John chapter 6, verse 48, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The word of God is the spiritual nourishment 
that we're to take in. And he goes further in John 6, verse 63, when he says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are of spirit and are of life. Do we see the emphasis on spirit? All of these things that we're doing, whether hunger and thirsting after knowledge, attending the Lord's services so that we can encourage one another, and then studying diligently are all spiritual things. They won't help us aerobically. They won't help our muscles to get any bigger, but they will help our spiritual selves on the road to uh, eternal life. And Peter confirmed this when he said to Jesus in chapter six, verse 68, that you have the words of life. Peter knew that Jesus had those right words. And so in order to, to grow spiritually, we need to get into the Lord's word. We need to be like the people of Berea. You know, the ultimate compliment for the Christian is that if someone says, oh, you're just like the Bereans. Because in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, when Paul was talking about the folks from Thessalonica, and by the way, Paul loved the church at Thessalonica. It was a wonderful church. Yet, he said, now these were more noble than those in Thessalonica talking about the people of Berea. Why were they more noble? For they received the word with great eagerness, and get this, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Each morning, I have uh, kind of grown into the habit of um, giving out the outline of my lesson. Now, I know it's in the bulletin, but because of uh, all of the COVID things, we haven't been running off the bulletin. Uh, Lee has been sending it out as an attachment. And so if folks have a computer with a printer, they can do this and they can run it off. And just to kind of bypass that and make it easier, I have actually provided an outline. When the service is over and you go home, if you really want to, if you want to be a Berean, you can get into those scriptures of the outline and see whether the things that I said that morning actually make sense, whether they were the truth, whether those scriptures applied in the areas in which I used them. You know what? On Saturday mornings, uh, you know, uh, most of you that know me, five days of the week, I write a devotional that I send out each morning about, oh, seven o'clock in the morning. It goes to uh, over 200 people all around the United States. Uh, I'm sure many of you that are listening to this get these devotionals. On Saturday, I've kind of made it not light, but made it interesting. On Saturdays, I make up a quiz, anywhere from 10 to 15 questions of things found in the Bible. I know Jane, my wife, loves to do the quiz. I know Melita does the quiz and sends it back to me and I grade it and send it back to her. Terry and Ron Clevenger, I know, do the quiz and send it back to me. Our late brother, Steve Damore, used to do the same thing. Um, Bible knowledge is a wonderful thing. But God doesn't expect us to remember every little trivial thing. Who begat who and what king did exactly what. But what we find out is the more that we study, the more that we will be able to tell people that we have hope. Because Paul said to Timothy, 
that he needed to understand how to rightly divide the word of God. And Peter said that your hearts ought to be such that when people look at you and see your Christian life, you ought to be able to give a defense for why you believe what you believe. That defense is found in the Lord's word. Finally, the fourth aspect of uh, Christian spiritual growth is regular prayer. And since uh, we talked about those folks in Thessalonica, we had that very, very short verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, in which Paul just puts it short. He, it's concise, you know, uh, it is to the point, and he says, pray without ceasing. Now, I like that one, but one of my very, very favorite verses in the Bible about prayer is in my favorite book in the New Testament, the book of Philippians. And in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, Be anxious in nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. Isn't that, that's some heavy stuff. He says prayer. He says with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with gratitude, let your requests be known to God. God wants to understand us, wants us, you know, when we go back to that first one, hungering and thirsting after righteousness. He wants us to be more godly. And one of the ways we get more godly is communicating with God constantly. Prayer is our means of talking to God. It's our means of offering requests to God whether they be requests for ourselves or requests for the health and well-being of others. And we know that God will take our cares. He's willing to take them if we'll just let him. Now, we don't always know exactly how he answers those prayers, but just to let him know our, the intimate details of our lives. This is also a time where we have private time with the Lord. And he says very often, and, and Jesus did it very often, he left his disciples and he went by himself and he prayed by himself, himself. You know, very often in a, in a prayer situation, one person stands up and prays for 20 or 30 or 40 people. And, and by the way, those are great. But I think God wants those intimate prayers on our part. He wants those prayers of, of uh, supplication. Uh, he wants us not to be anxious. And he wants us to be grateful. And he wants us to let our requests be known by him. And if we're not doing the right things, he wants us to confess to him. Confess to him in private. And you know what? If we're not putting the principles of growing as a Christian, of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, of attending the Lord's service, of studying diligently the Lord's word and obeying. We're like a piece of fruit that will die on the vine. When we put these principles into practice, then we will develop into a mature Christian. If we're not doing these things, we will die spiritually. And so, although I entitled this lesson as a new Christian, I'm sure that all of you, no matter how long you've been Christians, have taken this to heart. And you've looked at it and you said, this is what I need to do to walk down the right path with the Lord whether I was baptized a month, a year, or 50 years ago. We are all walking down the same path. We're all moving toward the same goal.
We can only get there if we grow spiritually each day. Let's close with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time that we were able to meet together, howbeit via this virtual means on YouTube. I pray that uh, those that listen, those that have uh, sung with us, those that have um, taken these words to heart, will know that these are important words for us if we are to grow spiritually and hope to reach the goal of living with you forever. Be with us, dear Heavenly Father, on our journey, because we need you. We need your word to be a, a lamp to our way and a light to our path. Help us to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Help us desire to be with others so that we can encourage them to love and good deeds. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to study your word diligently and pray, sometimes in public and sometimes on our own, that we might grow spiritually, that we would get beyond the milk stage and get into the spiritual meat that's there for us. Continue to be with us through this evening. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all.